fashion psychologist and I'm founder of Fashion is Psychology, your go-to destination for the science behind the power of clothing and beauty to dress your best self. Now, we often think of our clothing as things and possessions separate um, from ourselves, when in reality, they act as a second skin, and your personal style can help you befriend your body and manage your moods, um, meaning that your choice of outfit can have a profound impact on how you feel. We are joined by the lovely Ashley Chu. Um, Ashley Chu is an artist, activist, and cultural writer based in New York. Um, Ashley's paintings focus on resilience, rest, regality, and visibility of marginalized groups. Um, her clients and partnerships include Tom Hilfiger, Coach, Spike Lee, She's Gotta Have It, L'Oreal, and honestly, so much more. Um, currently, Ashley is a hashtag still standing artist in residence at Stonehenge in NYC, located in New York. So thank you so much, Ashley, for joining us. How are you? Thank you. I am doing good today. Thank you so much. I know we've been following each other for so long, <laughs> so, so long. Honestly, like I've been such a fan of Ashley. I'll never forget um, your amazing Black Models Matter bags. And I have to say that was truly like an inspiration for me for my master's thesis to just really look at the impact of that clothing can have and making such a statement and just saying something about your identity and who you are. So yeah, you're just amazing. And thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I really um, appreciate that. <laughs> so let's dive in. Um, the first question I wanna ask you is, how do your clothes make you feel? Clothing with me has gone through a lot of phases, which I'm sure with most people. Um, as a model in New York, I was kind of used to the all black New York uh, on the go look, fits for day, fits for night. And the more I've been getting into my art, the more I've been experience, experimenting with color. And um, I feel a real connection with color in my art. And so I've been studying what different colors mean, what they mean in marketing, what they mean in emotion, what they mean in artwork, what they mean in relation to people of color. And so I'm very careful about my color choices and my clothing choices because I also want, I want to look like walking art. So <laughs> that, that's usually what I go for. <laughs> That's amazing. And I know you shared pictures of, with me of your amazing color coordinated wardrobe. And I just think that's so fantastic. I have a color coordinated wardrobe as well, but it, it's not as amazing as Ashley's. I hope you posted it so everyone can get a chance to see it as well. Um, I love that idea you talk about walking art. And I really like to think about my clothing as, yeah, something to be cherished and something to be treasured as well. And I think when we're talking about things like sustainability, you know, a lot of the focus is on where to shop, but not thinking about, you know, the clothes that you truly have and making sure that they're things that are impactful and very meaningful to you. So in that same kind of chain of thought, what is your most treasured item that brings you joy? Well, I get a lot of clothing from events that I do, a lot of illustration events. Mm -hmm. I will say my Tommy Hilfiger Zendaya trench. Um, I really cherish that because that was from a collection they did of an all black show with all black models. And people were reselling that. And I'm like, absolutely not. <laughs> um, I love it so much. It's just so stunning. And it's literally a part of history. And with events, um, you know, they, they like to, to dress me. And I keep those clothes because it, it's a part of art. It's, it's a part. I want to be able to give it to my um, daughters or, or sons and be like mom wore this in her job and this is what she was doing in New York and so um that's that's really important to me I'm not like such a stickler about designers mm -hmm. per se like I'm not like oh I have this ten thousand dollar bag that I love I do have designer pieces but they're not they, they don't have as much like value to me uh versus something that I wear for like a special occasion or I have this men's like top shop shirt from years ago that I cut in half 
and I wear it probably every three days. I know people in New York are tired of seeing it, <laughs> but it's my favorite shirt. And it probably, I got it for maybe like 10 bucks on sale. So I think like just cherished pieces have nothing to do with, oh, I have this vintage designer bag. It could be sentimental for certain events and certain places. Yeah, I think that's so impactful when you talk about wanting to, you know, keep your clothing and hand it down. Like I've been finding so much research about the impact of clothing as kind of a time capsule and being able to share that that um, piece of clothing with someone, some a family member as well. You're kind of strengthening that bond and you're creating a kind of story within that piece of fabric as well. So I think that's amazing, especially as well when you talk about customization. I think people don't realize when you do customize something, you make it a little bit more your own. So it does have that extra bit of um, importance to you. And I think that's why it's so important to teach people about, you know, really cultivating their own style, not just taking everything off the rack, but, you know, investing in a tailor or just experimenting like you did with your own stuff and making it fun. And I think that's amazing. Um, I know you mentioned before a lot of your work um, talking about, you know, culture and um, really talking about racial discrimination and showcasing that through your clothing and through your art as well. So generally speaking, do you think that your clothes are political and do you think that they define you in any way? Absolutely, um, especially as a black woman artist, mm -hmm. we're only 4% in the world and galleries and art shows and showcases. And so we're already like kind of under the radar. And as a black woman, we're always told we're too loud, we're too much, we're, we're too big, we're too small, we're too this, too attitude. So as an introvert, um, I'm, I'm really introverted. I think people get that confused with a lot of introverts because of social media and because of modeling. But I am an introvert. <laughs> And so my desire to hide as an artist and be mysterious is also a confliction with being a black woman mm. and not being tucked away. I also think it would be a disservice not to wear the brightest colors mm. and be the most visible in the room because usually we're not. So I've been experimenting with bright colors in my paintings and in my wardrobe, I already have big, huge gold hair. So I, I just think like the bright, bold colors, especially, you know, I, I do have the privilege of, you know, I'm lighter toned. I know, I, I know that's privilege, but there, especially on social media, mm -hmm. oh, you know, black girls can't wear this color. They can't wear this color hair. Dark skin girls shouldn't wear this. Like, I don't believe that. There's people that argue all day about black people with blonde hair. Mm -hmm. I'm a black person with blonde hair. <laughs> so I just think in relation to color, we're even told not to wear certain colors. Yeah. And so I make sure I just wear all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And yeah, if you look at Ashley's Instagram, you'll see that it's very vibrant. And I think it's so interesting because I consider myself an introvert too. And I always like to say, like my clothes can, they can speak for me when I don't want to. When I want to keep something for myself, I kind of let my clothes do the talking. And I think you're the same way. And yeah, I just love that. Um, my next question is about COVID. So how do you think the pandemic has changed your relationship with your clothing? I actually moved um, in March. I moved from an apartment I was at for five years. And the thing is about being a model is you get so much thrown at you. Hmm. And you get like the most ridiculous, like, just silliest things, sometimes in gift bags, sometimes on set, sometimes in fashion week. You start to collect these things because they were free. Yeah. And I am the oldest of five. So like I've given a lot away to my sisters or to my former roommate, but it was just like so much stuff. And then also I turned 30 the same month that I moved, like two weeks later. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was doing a lot of filtering now especially because I just left a space in my life. I mean, that was five years of my life. Yeah. And I just stopped buying as much. I went more for pieces that um, I felt like I would get more use out, out of and like weren't as trendy. I even had this rule that I still stick to. If I buy one thing, I donate three. 
there is a Goodwill one stop away from me. And so I take clothes over there. It's Mm -hmm. very quick to get there. But I have this rule because if you can grab those three things that fast, you didn't need them. Yeah. And, and, you know, I just had a lot of ridiculous (laughs) things that I just didn't need. And Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to tailor things a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, So COVID definitely showed me like I didn't need all that stuff Mm. I didn't need all that stuff I didn't need to follow what everyone else was doing and I didn't need to accept things just because they were thrown at me yeah I think that's great I know it's hard when you're giving the free stuff I mean I know I'd find that hard if I was giving a bunch of amazing designer free stuff but it's good that you're trying to streamline I mean there's so much research that talks about you know the positive impact of minimalism on well-being so that makes complete sense but in line with that if you were to buy something next do you have your eye on anything or what would it be I would really okay so backstory um sex fifth avenue reached out to me a few weeks ago to um join their creators club so i will be doing a few things with them in terms of events Mm -hmm. and with that i get to kind of i get some cool incentives (laughs) so um i'm hoping to invest in a designer bag or a, a, um, I have designer bags but I would really like to get a designer bag and a few like black owned pieces luxury pieces I have five tall far bags right now so I probably don't need any more of those but I would really like a brand in Blackwood um, I really love Faye Noel pieces Brother Bellies so I have my eye on a few luxury black items um, I am Midwest born and raised very kind of country so I've never really spent a lot on designer pieces because I never really felt I still like even as a model I still feel weird wearing that much money sometimes (laughs) I'm like this is like my rent for six months so (laughs) it's something that I um am still I don't want to say struggling with but I also think that Black people, we still have this struggle with luxury items and wanting luxury for ourselves and feeling like we're not too much or too bougie because we want to own something. So I think I just need to get out of that and that it's okay to want nice things for myself, but for myself and not for social media, not to follow any trend. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I have a few, my eye on a few de- uh, black designer pieces for uh, the upcoming fashion week. That's amazing. And then, you know, speaking about black designers, I mentioned earlier about your Black Models Matter bag. You know, I just love to hear about, you know, your motivation behind creating that and the response you got afterward. Like, did you expect it? And how did you feel? At the time I was working as a production assistant and as a model. Mm-hmm. And I'd been working for as a production assistant for years prior to modeling, because this is when modeling was very 5'10 European. Mm-hmm. I am 5'8 and black. <laughs> so, no way are you 5'8? Oh my yeah, god. I'm I'm sure than people think. I'm like five, <laughs> five, seven and a half, five, eight. Oh um, and so modeling wasn't friendly to black people six seven years ago and if it was it was like okay we have Naomi we have Tyra we have this one black girl we don't need anybody else and the even the idea of blackness I think um a few years back when designers thought of black they just thought of like 100% African not African-American not biracial not lighter toned I still walk into castings for black girls and you know, sometimes white people are like, how? Like, why? Like, <laughs> they still don't understand that, like, Black comes in so many different shapes and forms and ethnicities. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, back in the day, runways were not as friendly. I mean, they're still not as friendly to uh, Black people. And so as a production assistant, I saw this firsthand yeah. backstage with my headset, with the run of the show. 
And when fashion started to open up a little bit, um, I actually did Kanye's show, Kanye, uh, Easy Season 3, the one that was Madison Square Garden. That definitely opened up um, more diversity. I think he had the most diverse show that fashion week. So Runway started to open up a little more. And um, I was, it was, the way that it happened was just so casual um because I was working as a production assistant I would have to wear all black but that was the first season I started going to castings mm. so I did Kanye's show I would maybe work a show in the morning as a PA and then maybe have my own show at night mm. so one day after working as a PA because usually that was at like five six in the morning anyway I was just like, you know, I'm seeing all these cool shows, but like, I don't see any black people. <laughs> I just don't. And I went back to the Airbnb I was staying at, my best friend who's also a model. And I was just like making coffee. And I had this black plain bag with me. And I just felt so plain, like walking the castings, walking. When, even when you're walking out as a PA, people would stop me and take my picture. Even if, And I was in all black and they would still be like, you have cool hair. Can we take a picture of you for street style? I had no street style. So I was like, you know what? I should write something on my bag because even after we're all black to castings and to, to shows, like maybe I could have like a bag that says something cool. And so I said to my best friend, I'm like, should I write like black fashion matters? Then he was like, oh, because at the time, like a lot of black designers weren't showing either. And I was like, you know, I don't know, maybe like black models matter. She was like, that was a better ring to it. So I just like wrote on my back. I didn't think anything of it. Like I literally had on like black slacks, black polo shirt, nothing too crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and I carried it to my shift as a PA. Then I went to hair and makeup for another show that I was doing that night. That show was diverse. Um, they actually, it was called FTL Moda. They actually were the first show to start putting disabled models on the runway. And so I did that show, very diverse, and left the show, went home, on the way home, somebody stopped me and was like, hey, like your bag is really cool. Can I take a picture of it? And um, they took a picture, didn't think anything of it. Like I was just going about my day. The next day as a PA, I was maybe working like 12 hours, couldn't have phones. And I leave my shift, open up Instagram, a trillion notifications because <laughs> they lock our phones all day. I think I had worked like an eight to eight that day. Oh and I was just like, okay, what is going on? And then um, I saw Vibe ran the first article and I was just like, Doo -doo -doo -doo, like just so many notifications. And I just like start crying because I'm so tired. Yeah. I didn't know, I, did, I just had so many notifications. I didn't know if it was good or bad. Mm. um so yeah the way that it happened was just really organically and it just had a domino effect from there I'm still like it's still so crazy to me because the reason why I mentioned the clothes so much is because I wasn't drawing attention to myself mm -hmm. and just I literally had on the most plain outfit you could possibly <laughs> think of. um nothing too crazy I wasn't allowed to because it was for work I was just like okay my handbag is the way that I can personalize this experience of working for me and and thinking in mind like hey as a PA I'm backstage I'm seeing one black girl and then I'm going to castings and I'm seeing one black girl this is what I'm feeling in this moment and it, and, and I wasn't thinking about it until that moment I was painting. Like I wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna paint this bag tomorrow or this is what it's gonna say. Literally was making coffee and I was like, mm, yeah, like maybe like black models matter because that's what I was feeling. That's exactly what my subconscious was on. Mm. 
yeah so it was completely organic like just going to making coffee and creating something and then next thing you know Zach Posen is taking a picture <laughs> and I just think it's just such a tremendous story um so I know you talked about how it was very difficult in terms of inclusion for black models when you were starting out do you think that that's changed um now are we see I know a lot of people are talking about more inclusion and representation but as like someone who's actively in the modeling industry can you see that yes and no <laughs> I know my last <laughs> answer was really long-winded yes and no um in the past year let me think about this in the past year we have seen black lives matter movement we have seen stop Asian hate. Mm -hmm. We have seen an attack on LGBTQ plus rights multiple times. This is the first in-person fashion week since lockdown from COVID. Last summer, we saw a lot of brands posting black squares, but yet their companies were all white. <laughs> so, um, I would say, yes, we are more visible. At the time, runways were less than 10%. Now, I think they are around 43%. Mm -hmm. um, the, the fashion spot actually sourced me for a few seasons uh, that that movement literally pushed numbers. But the issue with, if you're gonna be diverse, it needs to be all the way around. What's the point of putting 20 black models in a show if all your hairstylists are white and they can't do black hair? Yeah. Or what's the point of putting five black models in a show if you're telling them to bring their own makeup? So I do think we are more visible. I think half of that is to save face, honestly. But if you're going to be diverse, it needs to be it needs to be all the way through. You can't, it's just like slapping a Band-Aid on like a, a broken highway or something. <laughs> like you need to go all the way through. So this Fashion Week, I'm very curious um, with the past year of events and for people to think about the structure of the company and their brands. There's been a lot of publications and public figures that have shuttered because of that. Mm -hmm. So I'm just very curious to see if we've learned our lesson and I can't really make a gauge for that because I have the fashion week in, yeah. in two seasons. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see if people are actively, you know, moving beyond their black squares and are actually, you know, trying to make that impact. But I guess it's to be seen when the runway is actually fully open. Um, and then over on the blog, we had a piece published recently about modeling. And one of our writers likened it to a bit of a game and kind of talked about some of the harder parts of modeling that you don't really hear about. You know, you see the glitz and the gam on social media, but you don't know really what's happening back scene. Um, and you know, a lot of people talk about anxiety. Um, is that something you've experienced? Like what, what would be the harder parts of modeling that you think people don't really know about? Uh, definitely hair and makeup for me is always instant anxiety because if you're not feeling your best, you're not going to wear your clothes, you're going to, you know, not feel the most confident walking, representing brands and people can always like tell, they can always tell and it's just like, you know, if the white models don't have to bring their own makeup, if they don't have to do their hair, like models already get paid very minimal during fashion week. Mm -hmm. So if I'm coming to your show and I have to bring all of makeup and I have to do my own hair or twist out the night before, I'm doing your job and not getting paid for it. So that already makes me anxious because if you're running around to several locations a day, you don't have time to be coddling professionals, professionals that they more than likely flew in from other parts of the world. Mm. So it's just, that gives me anxiety <laughs> for sure. Um, I'm 30, so rejection for me isn't really like, I, I just leave. I'm like, okay, cool. I can go get a martini. 
<laughs> um, yeah, rejection for me does not bother me um, because I do believe that what's meant for me is for me. Like, yeah, there's things that I really want and I don't get, and that's totally fine. But it's been enough years for of rejection and on the daily with uh, just commercial castings and even with artwork. So I've been able to handle rejection like a champ. Um, so that doesn't really stress me out. Like that doesn't bother me at all, actually. <laughs> I'm probably too unfazed by rejection. <laughs> They're probably like, does she even want to do this? Um, <laughs> no, but the wins are always so much better. So the losses don't bother me, but I get more anxious about other people doing their job because I am so introverted. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think sitting backstage while everybody else is getting their hair done. Oh, and this is very common to me to this day. Oh, okay. Like you look fine. You, you just, just like fluff up your Afro, like no product, like just vibes. <laughs> so <laughs> that makes me nervous. Cause then it's like, if I'm there at the earliest call time, I'm sitting there for three hours while everybody's getting everything done. And then 10 minutes before the show, you're telling me that I'm fine. I could have just come 10 minutes before the show. So that's always just annoying. <laughs> yeah, it's frustrating. I mean, it's great that you say that, you know, rejection is something that kind of, you know, you have thick skin and you let it bounce off you, but it still shouldn't be the case, especially not in 2021. Like how many times have people, Black models been talking about this? Like just get the people in. There's more than enough qualified um, hairstylists to, you know, sort everyone out. So there's really no excuse now. And I definitely hope that that's something that can change soon. Um, but on to a lighter note, um, I know we've talked so much about color psychology and color. So I guess I want to know your approach to color psychology a bit more. Like, how do you really embrace color in your art and in your wardrobe as well? Like, what do you, what's your thought process when you're maybe putting an outfit together or putting a painter together? Like, how do you incorporate color into that? Well, my favorite color is green. Green and red, actually, ironically, because that's what we have on. <laughs> I'm a fiery red Aries. Um, so I do love red. Yeah. But I do love green. I, I think like every other Instagram picture is me in a green dress. <laughs> um, but I tend to, like, I keep like this chart and I have a lot of color theory books hmm. about what each color and emotion it evokes, like good and bad. Um, so in my paintings, I just like black people and people of color to just look as rich as possible. <laughs> as rich and as wealthy as possible without saying it. And I know that there's ways around color to do that with royal blues and with purple and with deep greens. And purposely in my paintings, I make the hair really crazy colors really loud because our hair has been discriminated against so much so I try and make that the focal point of each painting now with the color red favorite color but I don't put it in my paintings mm. not at this moment because historically red and bloodshed in paintings of black people mm. and of war and of slavery. Um, I just haven't really found a place where it fits in art. Um, Cause with art, it's a real, it's tricky cause it's interpretation because we're in a red dress. Oh, she's feisty, she's sexy, like she's hot. But in paintings, it, it's not always interpreted that way. So I do not paint black trauma. I know there's a lot of protest art out there. I know there's a lot of art and remembrance of um, fallen people and murder people. I understand the importance of that. I understand that we need it. We need to tell those stories. But I truly believe those are not our only stories. And we experience things besides trauma. So for me, when I'm seeing these works that have all this black and this red and gray, 
I like to go the other direction because I just don't want our time and our art and what we document on TV and film and music and art to just be about pain and violence and murder. Um, and so I'm very direct about my color choices and what brings out our skin tones and what brings out our hair because we, we you know, the, the bad things that we see is just a fraction of what we experience. There's still black excellence, black joy, black enterprise. And I just wanna make sure that that, even if I'm that one person doing it, which I know I'm not, but I want to make sure that if somebody looks back at 2020, 2021, they can see, okay, we have this of, of George Floyd, we have this about Trump, and then we have this beautiful painting somebody did during quarantine. I think we need to be documenting all triumph and all joy. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think there needs to be more balance, you know. Our stories are so multifaceted and we need people like you and we need other people who are talking about the harder and like the darker side too. But yeah, there needs to be balance in order to make sure that we are represented in the best light. So yeah, I completely agree with that. And, um, and I'm a crier. So I, <laughs> I'm a crier. Like if I go to paint something like that, I just won't even be able to make it through. I even I even paint stuff for people when a family member has passed from natural causes. And I just am bawling the entire process. So yeah. painting someone who has experienced police brutality energetically, that really affects me. Really, really affects me. And maybe one day I'm not count I'm not counting it out, but I think for now, my purpose is to show us in rest and triumph and, and our best selves. Yeah, I think that's so powerful. Um, yeah, like even like scrolling through the timeline and last year and seeing all of the riots and the protests, um, it was gut-wrenching. It was really hard and you can't really be in that space all the time. It, it's too much. Um, so it's good that you are balancing it out and showcasing the light and the joy because we need more of that. We need more Black joy. Um, so thank you for contributing to that as well. And again, on the topic of joy, um, we've done a lot of uh, research and I've done a lot of talks about dopamine dressing um, and you know just like dressing yourself happy just in general um, is that something that you engage in and have you noticed the impact of clothing on your mood? Uh, I definitely think color the color part has definitely changed um, at my old apartment like I said I just had so much stuff and then sometimes when you have too many choices, you don't want to choose anything. Mm. So I would just wear my same casting outfits every day. But even now with casting outfits, it's not the black pants, black tank top anymore. Like they're looking for people with more personal style, more personal branding that command a room. So I just think like taking more fashion risks for me and colors alone just give me just dopamine <laughs> so putting on a hot pink dress and like a neon blue shoe like yeah that makes me excited because we just get to do whatever like we, we get to do whatever and, and especially like being a new yorker i see the wildest outfits the wildest wigs and i'm like why have i spent the past five years just being so afraid in a city that is so unafraid yeah so yeah, I'm just going to keep experimenting with different color combinations and, and color theory. I love that. I love that. And um, what is the story, maybe, if you could tell us quickly, behind one of your favorite art pieces? One of my favorite art pieces. Oh, um, one of them I did of this piece of Africa. I'm actually doing one of Manhattan right now, it should be done any day now, but um, I did this piece of Africa and it sold. Okay. Spike Lee's team reached out and they were like, we want this painting and we want this painting. We're filming a, a series. 
And I was like, well, that one's sold and that one's not for sale. <laughs> <laughs> to Spike Lee's team. My mom thought it was crazy. Um, and so I told him, I was like, I can recreate it and we can do it bigger. Yeah. So I redid the piece bigger and they bought it. And it was in Nola Darling's room for She's Gotta Have It and She's Gotta Have It Too. And then I made them rent the other painting, which was one of Nefertiti. And I still have it. <laughs> I made them give it back um, because I, I wanted to be able to have it um, for myself. And then when I go to have children, I'm, I'm like, that was in the Spike Lee's things. <laughs> So it's in, it's like literally like five feet away from me, but um, yeah, like those pieces have sentimental value to me because being a part of anything you do with Spike Lee is being a part of black history. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like that is like the, the tier of black film history. We're all making black history, but yeah. And, and I've met Spike and he's just, he's, He's a really cool person, really intense person, but you, but you understand when you when you see him. So, yeah, that that's the story behind my favorite art pieces. I love that. What a fantastic story! And just <laughs> to cherish. I love that. Um, and then moving from art into clothing, our last question is: What is your favorite like designer, um, or maybe favorite like modeling campaign that you've ever worked on? Favorite campaign. Favorite campaign, uh, L'Oreal's Dark and Lovely. Um, as a person that used to box color my hair, <laughs> it was so crazy to do a campaign that's just historical for Black people yeah. and do a campaign with that very box <laughs> that I used to use on my hair. So, so um, I did that earlier this year. That was definitely really cool. And when I saw the call sheet, it happened to be with the black photographer that I'd worked with before who shot me for Essence and with a black makeup artist that I'd worked with before. So it was just really cool to see all of us in that space and for her, a black hair campaign, especially black hair is still just so political, more <laughs> political than, than clothing. Um, so that's definitely my favorite. I have not done a campaign for a black designer yet, but I am hoping so. I'm still going to the casting, so I hope that that happens. Yeah. I have done two Yeezy shows, um, Yeezy season three and season four, but I'm definitely hoping to work with more designers. Amazing. Well, you have done so much and honestly, you've been such an inspiration to me and I'm sure so many other people. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Maybe tell everybody where they can follow you or find out more about what you're doing next. Thank you so much. I think what you're doing is fascinating because it's, it's literally things that people do not think about. Mm. Um, so thank you for bringing light about just how emotionally we are connected to clothing and, and color and sustainability and fast fashion. Um, I think that we need to talk about this more because we just consume so much and we don't know why. And then you look back and you're like, did I need to take every gift bag from fashion? <laughs> <laughs> did I need to take every shirt that says, I love coffee? <laughs> So I think the work that you're doing is absolutely important. Um, you can find me at ashleybchu.com or ashchu on Instagram. I don't really steer too far from my name on anything. So if you type in Ashley Chu, you will find my work and everything else. And on models.rt, same thing, Ashley Chu. Amazing. Well, that brings our first video series of hashtag My Second Skin. Thank you everybody for watching. Um, make sure that you subscribe to our newsletter over on fashionispsychology.com and you can follow us on Twitter, Fashion is Psych, and on Instagram at Fashion is Psychology. And you can follow me as well on Instagram at Shakayla Elise. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Such a fantastic conversation and I hope you can have more.